so the montage is is terrible. So of course, you know, they, they bust those two ghosts and uh, they start, you know, working again, being ghostbusters. Wait, where is Winston during all this? He was there in the courtroom with them. Why is he not helping? Did he just run away? Did I miss that? But this scene is this movie's version of the hotel scene in Ghostbusters, which it's the scene where the Ghostbusters prove themselves and become the Ghostbusters again. We came, we saw, we kicked its ass. Oh, wait, no, that's, 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 that's the first one. And then we get the Ghostbusting montage. I didn't like it in the first one, and, like, somehow they made it perfectly worse. Which, just like in the first movie, did you like the first movie? Here it is again. If I could point out one other standout in the movie for me, it would be the courtroom scene. The Scolari brothers felt like a genuine threat, albeit smaller ones, but the scene gave us some solid Ghostbuster action. Something that would have been nice to have more of instead of another montage of scenes over a hip-hop track. In the first movie, it kind of seemed like a good idea to establish business was starting to pick up. In this film, it was like a moment, Hey, we're back in business. Ghosts are everywhere. Ah, let's go. And we're just, we're suddenly busy again. It's really odd. Everything afterwards just like goes to straight shit. All right, so they're out there busting ghosts. They're finding more ooze and we're, we're doing it to run DMC and their take on Ghostbusters. Dot is just not as good. I mean, it's it's 80s. It's great. We got the nice parody of the TV show commercial, which, again, you may have heard at some point during the season of Podcasters Assemble, but I, I just miss the original song. Oh, my God, the song sucks in this montage. Holy shit, just play the Ghostbusters theme again. You have it. I heard it at the start. What is this? What is this bullshit you're playing right now? It's so bad. It's terrible. This is this is not this isn't the song. Hey, there's Janine though. That that's good. Really, there was a lot of changes to this one to try and make it feel more like the cartoon. You had Janine, whose hairstyle and clothing style changed drastically in order to make her look more like uh, her counterpart on the cartoon. Slimer being back is fun. I mean, I guess he's never really, like, a super horrible ghost outside of just making a mess and eating things, also known as Onion Head, but here very much, you know, kind of Slimer. So they tried to make Slimer a bit more fun, um, similar to his character in the cartoon. Honestly, it surprises me he wasn't in the film more. I can just hear that studio executive saying, Hey, kids are all about this Slimer guy, right? He's a hip new character everyone loves. So, what can we do to make him the focal point of this movie? Could he possibly go with the Ghostbusters and help him hunt other ghosts? Could he be a Ghostbuster too? Maybe we let him go off on his own adventure in its own movie. How fun would that be? I'm convinced this conversation happened. Winston, obviously, again, had to shave off the mustache to look more like the cartoon. I think Egon's hair got a little taller. So there were, there were definitely some things for this film. I mean, there's so much fun behind the scenes trivia, but I think that's the main one is just how much that they had to change in this movie in order to make it resemble the cartoon. Like, is this, was this the midpoint of the film? This might have been the like dead center of the film. And like everything after this is notably worse than everything before this. Okay, so I understand the whole reason behind Ghostbusters 2 logo with the ghost stepping through and holding up two for the movie why would you have that outside the firehouse though you're still ghostbusters you're still employed you haven't changed the company you're t- t- why it's a bit of a shame that the two greatest actors in this film are the foreign comedic relief and the inanimate painting since ghosts seem to be back i mean i guess they all disappeared until the ghostbusters went on trial i don't know and whatever they are still back in business, making hand over fist and cash, thankfully. I mean, that runner ghost was cool. Uh, I do like the callback to the first movie where you could see Dana watching their commercials on TV. We get another crap commercial. Look it up on YouTube. It's great. The, it's way worse than the first uh, movie. I do like in this montage when you see the commercial that they made with Rick Moranis' character. I'm just going to call him Rick Moranis. Does anyone remember his character's name is Louie? The free mug and balloons for the kitties. Ooh, a hot beverage thermal mug and free balloons for the kids. 
I'm not gonna lie, I really want that hot beverage thermal mug. Wait, is that a thing? Can I get that? Is that a real thing? Hold on. When they learn how the slime works is interesting, uh, they insult it with dumb things. Great lines. You're nothing but an unstable short-chain molecule. And then they say that they also say really nice and sweet things to it to build the self-esteem and make it, like, settle down again. Now, I love, love the pink slime, you know? And then there's a weird moment where Vagwin is like, you aren't sleeping with it, are you? And Egon just, like, quietly walks away. Now, does he mean just sleeping, like, cuddling? Or are we... Are we acting like Dana and Lewis at the end of Ghostbusters 1? Also, apparently Egon fucked the slime. He's fucking the goo. What? What? Did we just gloss over that? Man, this is almost as horny as a Star Trek episode from Too Young for this track. Uh, and then they, they, they pour some goo into a toaster, and it does a little dance. Not a very controlled dance. I just love it. This, like, musical slime that you can activate. It's so, such a cool idea. But they make a huge logical leap near the end of the movie with this little science experiment. I mean, this is to set up something that happens at the end that I'll talk about, but, like, it's not enough setup. Does it, does it have to be upbeat music? Can it be anything? If we put on thrash metal, is it going to bite the head off a bat and punt a baby? I mean, what, what are we dealing with here? Anyway, Vankman visits Dana at work at the art museum. He meets Janice Janusz. for the first time, and this is when you realize that because they're kind of building up Rick Moranis' character in this movie, maybe they realized after the first movie that a lot of people were rooting for him. So now Janice Janusz playing the twerp who likes Dana, but isn't gonna get it because Vankman's too cool. But in this scene, Dana mentions to Vankman that she feels like the painting is almost watching her, smiling at her. Why is the Vigo painting smiling oddly at Dana? Like, that is like, if he's interested in the baby, why is he trying to court Dana or smile weird at her? It's weird. Weird things in this movie. Seriously, Vigo scared the crap out of me as a kid. I don't know, it feels like this scene should have come before we see the giant Dracula head appear in the painting and shoot the guy with a laser. I don't know. It's like, it's like setting up something ominous to happen when we've already seen we've already seen it we already know a big zordon head lives in there then there's a scene in dana's apartment that really once again scared the shit out of me as a kid and now probably the bit that scared me most as a child is all the stuff where you know it all starts coming to life in Scorny Weaver's flat? I don't know. It was the baby endangerment, I think. I was really freaked out by the idea that I'd be watching a movie where a baby potentially died. Which, I mean, the baby is fine through this whole movie. Obviously, Ghostbusters isn't going to kill a baby. But it freaked me out as a kid. Now, before we talk about Sigourney Weaver taking her shirt off, there was a scene that I'm like, all the new dads on this podcast and in podcasts of Simmel in general are like, great, my work is following me home. Because that kid is a lot of effort. Thanks for reminding me, guys. Don't want kids. You know, more stuff's going on with Oscar and Dana. In this scene, Dana is about to give her child a bath when a bunch of goop starts pouring out of the faucet. But oh, the water turns to pink slime. And then her bathtub kind of becomes a, a living creature with a big pink mouth that reaches out and tries to swallow them. Th this really did freak me out as a kid. It was just like, it was terrifying. It, that, that, it was just absolutely terrifying. That weird pink thing in the bath that kind of follows around the slime. Just, ah, uh, rank. I think I might have first seen this at the drive-in or something as when I was really little. And that scene with the slime coming through into the bathtub terrified me. Oh, it was just so, so terrifying. Oh, and it becomes a giant pink sock monster. I don't know why the bathtub is made out of rubber for a minute when it's, like, reaching towards them. I don't know if it's if that was intended or if it's just a shitty prop. You know it's not as good as? The scene where she opens her fridge and there's a hellhound inside of it. There's, a, there's an analog for a scene just like this in the first Ghostbusters, but it's better there. Dana runs to Peter because, well, where else are you gonna go? Peter then calls... Ray and Egon to go check out her apartment. We find out Vankman lives in a walk-up pretty large, but imagine moving. Ugh. 
No. So I've already not really been liking the interaction between Venkman and Dana. And then when she comes to his house after, you know, being attacked again, like, I really hate this. I, I really hate their interaction. And like, Venkman gives off some real Bojack Horseman vibes, shunning responsibility uh, for personal pleasure in the face of real danger. You know, danger to the woman that he's trying to win over. Like, he really is just a frat boy. Again, Murray's scenes with Dana are gold. Like, I have all cheap new moves. And then putting the kid down by insulting him. Like, that that's just great. Many subtle levels of clean and dirty. Again, all perfect writing for him, but they couldn't get that together when they were all together. We get another scene of Venkman being a lovable creep. His, his behavior is a little more concerning in this movie than it was in the first. Like in the courtroom scene, when like he brushes against the female lawyer, and he's like, Hey kitten, I'm like, hmm, I don't know, I don't know about that, Venkman. Next day, the Ghostbusters suit up and head on down to the museum. Well, Egon, Winston, and Ray suit up. Peter just shows up in casual wear because, I don't know, maybe this is part of Bill Murray phoning it in? They want to go check out the Vigo painting and how it's been bothering Dana. So Ray and Egon do some research, and, and they find out that Vigo the Carpathian is potentially a uh, warlock or something like that. I don't know. But they go to the museum and they take a bunch of pictures. Venkman is like, you know, taking pictures of the painting and being like, Oh yeah, oh, give it to me. Like, you really, it settles in that Venkman is a fucking maniac as you watch this movie. Little known fact, those rubber hoses that you see coming out of the Ghostbusters uniforms, those are actually there in case they um, get scared while busting that they don't wet themselves. Yeah, true story. Don't ask me how I know that. Then some hooking up starts happening because Venkman makes a date with Dana while Louie, or Lewis, however he says his name in this movie, while Rick Moranis makes a date with Annie, the secretary. The extreme change in Janine and seemingly unnecessary interaction between her and Lewis make me think that there are a lot of references to the cartoon. Because there is no reason for this to be happening. Who I gotta say, some about the big, like, round glasses and the red wig. I don't know, she kind of does it for me in this movie. Wasn't, wasn't Annie, like, into Egon in the first movie? I guess Egon's a science sexual. Because there is no reason for this whole, like, weird dinner conversation to be happening. Also, how do they, how do they even know each other? When have they hung out? Well, Lewis got a lot of, um confidence after nailing Dana at the end of the movie. Granted, it was in dog demon form, but you know, hey, it's a confidence booster. Egon and Ray are examining the photos of the Vigo painting that Venkman took while he was orgasming, and they find out that hidden inside the photos is an image of the river of slime that they saw beneath New York City. And then there's actually a, a pretty scary scene where all of the pictures ignite into flames and and uh, Ernie Hudson has to save them. I hate that I forgot his character's name. Hey, Winston, you did something. You busted through a door with a uh, fire extinguisher. That's great. I wish you did more in this movie. Why don't, why don't they use Ernie Hudson more? He feels like he's there. It's like they're on a trike with the spare tire. Winston. Winston has to save them. Winston has just a little bit more to do in this movie than in the first one. Not much, but a little. Anyway, then Egon, Ray, and... I forgot his f***ing name again. Winston go underground in search of this river of goo. Venkman doesn't join them because he's already busy trying to lay some pipe. <laughs> I'm so f***ing sorry. I'm ruining your podcast. So the fire in the black room is the most real terror in this film after the cradle scene because there are no visible ghosts, uh, but there's a lot of activity going on and like genuine possibility of someone dying. Uh, and, and looking back at kind of the rest of this film, that sort of seems to be like 
the ghosts are there for entertainment value, but the Ghostbusters are the ones who cause real damage. You know, so it, it's there's just this weird juxtaposition of like where the fear should be. Like when you see a ghost, it's not scary, but when you don't see ghosts, it is kind of generally scary. Peter and Dana head out for their date while Ray, Egon, and Winston head on down into the tunnels to the old subway system to check out the River of Ooze. And also, uh, uh, Louis Tully, which is played by Rick Moranis, and uh, uh, Janine, I don't remember her actor's name, they're kind of end up being kind of a couple now, which is kind of weird. Uh, they, they, they play a lot more active role in the second movie. Uh, you know, Rick, Moran- Rick Moranis is just awesome in whatever he's in. Uh, Janine just kind of felt weird to me. But I think a lot of that is because I'm used to how she was. In, at the time, I was used to how she was in the cartoon. And she you know, they wasn't quite the same, and so it was it's very strange. Heading along the old transit system, and they each shout out for the echoes, and then you get that super creepy... <laughs> that creeped me out as a kid. And then immediately after that, all those heads on pikes... Oh, God, that was so, so creepy. This scene in the abandoned, like, subway tunnel is actually a pretty good scene. Like, like the, there are good scenes in this movie, which is why it's kind of frustrating. It's like, every scene that's good in this movie is a scene that feels unique to this movie. Like, there's no real analog for this subway scene in the first Ghostbusters. It feels new. It's one of those rare things that feels new in Ghostbusters 2. And also, I do like, to give this movie credit, that the ghosts are still played, sometimes, to actually be scary. Like, this scene is legitimately scary, when all of the decapitated heads appear all around them. I mean, this is a PG-rated movie. I know PG meant something a little different back in the 80s. But, uh, yeah, I can see how, as a kid, this would have scarred me. Strangely, I don't remember being that afraid of the decapitated heads. I was scared of the ghost train. Which comes next. I don't know why. <laughs> All it does is pass through them and then, and then pieces out. The faces on sticks were terrifying, especially as a kid. An old ass steam train hitting Winston was pretty fun. Uh, I mean, honestly, Winston doesn't do much in this movie yet again, but everyone loves him as Everyman Ghostbuster. I don't remember the cartoons much, I think we're coming to that later on, but hopefully he did more then. Winston, I forgot his name fucking again. Winston gets hit by the ghost train, but he's fine because it was a ghost. What a, what a cool scene. This is a cool scene. Ghostbusters 2, imagine if you had original ideas like this. Oh, River of Ooze. Yes, let's let's drop a let's drop a long line of rope that's attached to our belt to see how deep it is. This what could go wrong? What could go Oh, that's just what could go wrong. There goes Winston. Bye Winston. That's why you're in this movie. Oh, they're jumping in. Oh, that's a horrible idea. They fall into the river of slime, and when they emerge from the sewer later, they're really pissed off at each other. Ray and Winston have the least convincing fight in cinematic history. I kind of know what they're going for with it all, because what the slime does is basically it reacts to the mood of the people, either locally or in the case of like the city. It has kind of a vibe for just kind of you know rudeness and just being kind of mean to each other. And um, so kind of all this negative energy is what's basically powering the slime. And uh, this river of slime kind of goes all the way down into, uh, basically ends at the museum, uh, which is where, you know, Vigo the Carpathian's at. And uh, what, what ends up happening, like, they, they kind of get covered in the slime and basically they, they start fighting with each other because the slime itself is, like, infusing that negative emotion inside of themselves. And then... Egon orders them to take off their clothes. And now they start stripping. And when they do, they're happy again, and it's because they're covered in hate juice. They're still kind of wearing a lot of ooze. I mean, if 100% ooze was turning them evil, they're still covered in roughly 30% ooze. They would still be 30% irritated with each other. Egon says it's pure concentrated evil, and it's running through New York City, and it's powered by all the negative emotions of New Yorkers. This is this is actually very realistic. We also have a third side story, this time between Janine and Tully. Last movie, Janine was trying to get into Egon's pants. This time it's Tully's. She just wants that workplace romance. 
I thought the accountant version of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves is fun. And Rick Moranis has a line, I used to have a roommate, but my mom moved to Florida. Annie and Lewis are babysitting the baby. <laughs> Who's going to remember the baby's name? The baby's name is the baby. They're babysitting the baby while Dana and Vankman are out on a date. And Annie is coming on to Lewis really hard. And you know what? Good for both of them. Ah, Janine and Lewis are getting along um, nicely. That's... Oh my. Just let these two smash. Ghostbusters 2 letting these two characters smash. It's it's like the best thing Ghostbusters 2 did. But Egon, Ray, and Winston rush into the restaurant where Vankman and Dana are eating. And their date is going pretty well. It looks like they're gonna start a romance again. You know, the one that already happened in the first movie. And now we're just walking down the same lane again. Anyway, they come in acting like raving lunatics, and some security guards escort them all out of the building. You know, half-naked covered in news, they go find Peter and Dana in the restaurant, and then they're arrested by cops. Eh, that, alright. That follow that tracks. That tracks like the original movie. Well done. That Bobby Brown song was terrible. But the chorus is pretty decent. And stuck with me. Apparently it's in GTA 5, but I don't listen to that station often. Oh, Bobby Brown, on our own. That's a catchy earworm. Just can't... can't shake it. Now it's just stuck in my head. God damn it! And then Dana comes home and finds her two babysitters, Lewis and Annie, just making animal noises on the couch. And then, and then Lewis comes over and he's like, Oh, jeez, oh, I'm sorry, I was just making cheeks clap, sorry about that. Well, the, the guys, they end up going to the mayor, because they find out that, you know, that the, the slime is basically mood slime. They somehow, like, make this way to make it positive slime, uh, you know, so where it does the opposite of what the negative slime does. It gives you good vibes or whatever. But uh, they go to the mayor and... Say, you know, the mayor's like, you want me to just tell everybody to be nice to each other, you know. But th- he has like an assistant that, you know, is going to take care of him instead, and, and unbeknownst to the mayor, and basically sends him to, a, you know, a mental institution. That sniveling mayor's aide, also another one of those those guys that you've seen before a million times, serves the same role as Dickless from the first movie. But the lines here are so good. There seem to be three million miserable assholes living in the tri state area. I will say that. Since 1989, that number has increased a lot. Being miserable is every New Yorker's God-given right. Oh, Dickless 2.0 has the uh, Ghostbusters sent to a mental ward. That's great. Ooh, the doctor at the psychiatric hospital is the CEO from Christmas Vacation. That guy with the Jelly of the Month Club. That asshole. Put it over there with the others, greaseball. I do like the smash cut, though, from the mayor's assistant being like, his little twerp assistant, I hate that guy, being like, hey, why don't we go downtown and you explain all this that you just told us about the river of slime to some of my friends down there, and then immediate cut to them in straight jackets. That was fucking great. I don't know how we get to the straight jacket part. This seems kind of extreme, and, and like... I, I know you're supposed to leave believability on the shelf, but like this movie is making some really weird decisions, like extreme decisions, like from one scene to the next. And it, it's getting difficult to like leave that believability on the shelf. And then the big dumb Power Rangers head is yelling at Janice Janos some more in the art museum. He wants, he wants the baby. He wants Dana's baby so he can be reincarnated. And then Janus Janos is like, well, can I have her? And he's like, okay, you can be my mom and dad. Which, I don't know. This is, this is a kink for Vigo, I think. The baby's name is Oscar. I just found that out. Thanks, IMDb. This podcast sponsored by IMDb. And while that's going on, um, Oscar is basically, you know, uh, uh, Louis Tully and Janine, they're babysitting Oscar. And Dana ends up getting there, too. To, um... You know, head on out onto the the crawl space, whatever's right outside the window. Why does he do that? That seems so. How did this toddler do that? He's not old enough or skilled enough to do any of this. And why does Dana keep living on like the top corners of buildings where bad things happen? Like 22 to 25 stories up. This is a bad idea. And is just like teetering on the edge over all the. There's a 
ton of child endangerment in this movie. Like, baby child endangerment. The worst kind. And then the weird lady ghost thing with the pram comes and steals her child out of the window. And, like, that scared me enough as a kid. I used to sometimes just be awake looking at my window thinking, is a fucking ghost going to turn up and take me away? Like, what the hell's going on in the world? Like, this can't be real. <laughs> it, you know, it wasn't. I was just being an idiot child. But, you know. But then Janice Janusz. shows up as a ghost? As a ghost and also dressed like a uh, old woman? So that's supposed to be Janusz as a, a ghost nanny with... A stroller. Why? Why is he a ghost? Why does he have stretchy arms? How did Dana know that was Janos? How, how could she tell that was him and piece this all together? I never realized that as a kid, and now I'm just piecing it together now, and I'm not sure this makes sense. His arm stretches out, and he grabs the baby and flies away with her. We never see Janus Janos do anything like this before or after in this movie. Whatever. And yes, yeah, Sigourney Weaver really plays the role well of like the terrified mother trying to protect her child. And me now, as a, you know, pushing 40 person with two small children, I'm still terrified that ghosts are going to come and take my little girls away. <laughs> you know? One of the things like Ghostbusters 2 does that isn't really, because Ghostbusters 1, there are probably scary moments in it, but I don't really remember it being scary. Whereas. Ghostbusters 2, whether, whether it's Vigo, the whole possession thing, Janos himself, especially this scene where he's basically kidnaps the baby. And I, maybe it's partly just because it's a baby that's involved. It's very disturbing. <laughs> it's just, this, this film messed me up. But, you know, I like it. Good film. Dana takes off for the museum to go rescue Oscar. While the Ghostbusters are in a mental ward, saying that they don't want to sign up for the Jelly of the Month Club. I do like the scene because it's a recurring thing where Vankerman is the only Ghostbuster that knows how to talk like a human, even though he's he's also insane and completely unhinged. He at least knows what normal people find strange. He just doesn't care. But the rest of the Ghostbusters have no idea how to not come off as delirious maniacs. And I love the scene in the insane asylum where they're explaining the plot of the movie without any self-awareness of how ridiculous it sounds and Vakeman just turns to the doctor and he's like I think these people are completely nuts and then just slams his head back down on the table and in true frat boy Bojack fashion as the movie progresses Vinkman's persistent attitude changes from uh, tired of having to return to this job to I want no involvement with any of this unless it's for popularity. Uh, and this is a statement that kind of rings true for the entirety of the film from like the dinner scene to uh, the insane asylum scene. He wants to just be lazy until someone's paying attention. And then he's like, no, 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 I am the voice of the Ghostbusters. I really hate this character. Bill Murray is a treasure. Bill Murray playing himself and Peter Venkman just saying that, ah, well, the other three guys are completely nuts. So Dana goes to the art museum, which he figures is where baby Oscar is, and of course he is. Baby Oscar is now fully in the clutches of Vigo. Aw, Oscar's wearing Pooh Bear onesie? That's adorable. He wants to reincarnate. She knows the whole plan now, but she's stuck there because the art museum has been encased in goop. So the slime starts to take over the city, it encases the museum with the picture of Vigo, which still terrifies me. Oh look, it's oozing, it's all over the museum, it's covering the museum. It's a nice little shell of jelly. We get the montage of ghosts attacking the city, which is bah, 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 like the first movie, mm, but not as good. All the pink slime covering the museum and then seeping up through the sewers throughout the city it kind of reminded me of The Blob. Damn, that was actually a pretty good horror movie. I need to rewatch that. Pouring out of buildings, coming up from the ground. Cannibal Girls, Eugene Levy. Wasn't that like the director's film? The slime just... It seems to be like everybody loves the slime. Well, I wasn't one of those people that loved the slime. I don't think... I think people, they, you know, they, they really did some, really double down on the slime thinking that that was something that everybody really likes about Ghostbusters. And I don't know that that was necessarily true. 
at the demon ghost. That's great. The minx coming to life was great. There, there are still some clever moments. I like, I like the rich lady walking over the goop, and her fur outfit comes to life. All the little animals start growling at her and biting at her, and then it just kind of scurries away. That was a pretty interesting idea. Again, what determines how the ghost looks as like a giant Muppet, or if it's humanoid looking? The people walking off the Titanic clearly look human. And also, the Titanic just arrived. Great line. Great ghosts. Hey, we got a call from the docks. The Titanic just pulled in. And then you see the Titanic and all, all of the ghost passengers are walking out of it. And we get a Cheech Marin cameo. It's even Cheech from Cheech and Chong saying, better late than never. Most people will probably say, I know him from Cheech and Chong. I've never seen a Cheech and Chong movie. I know Cheech from uh, Nash Bridges and Oliver and Company. The Titanic joke's pretty clever. I, I, you know, I think that works for me. And then the mayor's like, hey, I need the Ghostbusters. And he sends his little twerp assistant. I hate that guy. I hate that f***ing assistant. The terrible mayor's cabinet is called, and they need to get the Ghostbusters back. Oh, that's Ben Stein right there. God, God, he looks young. And the museum gets enveloped by this slime in the shell that nobody can penetrate. And at this point, the mayor figures out that what his assistant did and freeze the Ghostbusters. Oh, hey, look, the mayor now wants the Ghostbusters. Yeah, sure, wait until the shit really hits the fan. Now you're ready to listen, sure. Again, why do people forget what happened five years ago? And then they they suit up and go out to save the day. All right, Bobby Brown, that's, that's our anthem of the movie, I guess. And they approach the goop with all, everyone in the city cheering them on, and they zap it, and fuck all happens. It doesn't do anything. It does shit. That's the end of the movie. What an avant-garde ending. Just a Ghostbusters fail and credits. No, that's not what happened. The crowd immediately starts booing the Ghostbusters. Really? Come on. What person booing in the background? What the hell have you done recently with your life? to try and reduce the giant amount of jello that is taking over New York. You haven't even eaten a spoonful, so shut up! Sit down and enjoy your jello. Egon deduces that the jello mold of ooze is just filled with hate, and they need something that's going to be massive and positive to even break through it. They're like, we need to inspire these people. And then they all look at a license plate with a picture of the Statue of Liberty, and they're all as one are like, we have an idea for a terrible third act. Their, their solution to this, well, we got to like create positive vibes with everybody. What's the best way to do that? Clearly the Statue of Liberty, I guess? So the Ghostbusters somehow get to Liberty Island. I didn't see a boat in sight. And hell, they didn't even have a police escort like in the last movie. They were just... Let loose on National Park land. This is not controlled by the New York City. Just throwing it out there. Uh, Ghostbusters 2 tries to capture the magic of the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man, which was wonderful and childhood defining with a moment where they spray a bunch of ghost goo inside the Statue of Liberty and they bring the Statue of Liberty to life. And that's the giant thing that's going to stomp through the city in this movie. And so they just they just spray the Statue of Liberty with slime and play higher and higher so that they can control it and make it move and then smash their way into the museum. Except this time it's a good giant thing because it's meant to inspire New Yorkers and not absolutely f***ing terrify them and probably destroy all the roads as forgiving as you are of movie logic. They use the positive slime to basically animate the Statue of Liberty. And, you know, basically they just start marching down the street with this thing. Brilliant. Of course, in the movie, it has the desired effect. Everybody's cheering. Whereas I think in reality, <laughs> you would have people terrified out of their minds over this. It's, it's kind of, it's it's campy. Uh, it's it's funny. But it, it, honestly, it's, I don't really like that like that scene all right so the uh the boys settle up with some speakers some batteries we've got uh positively charged slime which they um did egon sleep with all the slime to make it positive is this the process i mean egon was in for a wild night i guess that, that's a whole other spinoff series that i don't know if i want to we're probably going to cut eric i don't want to cover that in podcasters disassembled 
Eric, don't make me figure out how Egon made made the slime. I don't want to do it. This just crosses the line. Stop DMing me, Eric. I don't wanna. Like, they set it up with the toaster dancing earlier, but the toaster just, like, had a seizure. It didn't, like, do anything that made you think you could have control of it, and they spray all this goo inside the Statue of Liberty and plop down this fucking Nintendo NES controller. I love the Nintendo controller, or the knockoff t- Nintendo controller being the guide for the statue. Brilliant. One of the funny things is, you know, they control it, they bring out this, uh... Nintendo, uh, uh, oh, well, I forget what they're called, but they're like a, like a Super Joystick they made for Nintendo. Oh, hey, that's right. They used an NES Advantage controller. I had one of those. Not sure how that works, though. Does it plug directly into the statue, or do they have to, like, have a slime statue controller interface? I could not, for the life of me, figure out how to ever drive anything with that. I, I plugged into all sorts of equipment. I mean, the N- Nintendo it worked on, but no. And that's how they control the Statue of Liberty, which comes to life and is perfectly animated. It's fe- like its feet and like it moves just like a giant person. Even its robes start flowing like they're made of real fabric. Shouldn't it just jerk around if you're if you're you if you're just like blowing up what the toaster did? It shouldn't just like blah, 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 just like jiggle on its foundations and fall over. But whatever, it works perfectly. Somehow, I don't know, it's, it, it, somehow no one dies, <laughs> somehow it doesn't cause mass hysteria, it makes everyone clap and cheer. One of the biggest, uh, no pun intended here, moments in the movie that felt forced to me was the inclusion of the living Lady Liberty. This felt like a deliberate attempt to replicate the Stay Puff Marshmallow scene, and it feels way too outlandish. So... Follow me here with some of this pseudoscience, and I know this is fantasy, but just follow me here. So, when they slime the toaster, the toaster has to move within the confines of its construct. It bounces, because it's a toaster, and that's what it is. It can just move, but as a toaster, just bouncing up and down. Yet, the Statue of Liberty is no longer made of copper, and it can move with super fluidity? Again, I know it's fantasy, uh, but it doesn't mean I have to like it. Robes are moving fluid like they're actual robes. I I know that's not what she is actually made of, but I just write this off as the ability of the slime because we saw Dana's tub actually change shape and it wasn't supposed to physically be able to do that. So, yeah, slime has fun properties. The Walkman playing higher and higher is pretty damn good, though. I actually remember that song now more from the end of Death to Smoochie. I know, I know, it started here, but it's since been co-opted in my brain. Man, these songs that I keep hearing in this movie, it's it's screaming 80s. Positively uplifting stuff, but God, I don't want to listen to it. (sighs) The whole bit with the Statue of Liberty towards the end uh, just kind of lost me. I get that they wanted to do something big and iconic like the first movie, but... I honestly think it would have had more impact if the story had bigger personal stakes, but maybe a smaller scale threat. That said, I do like the nod to the NES Turbo Controller. So the water around Liberty Island is around 60 feet deep. Uh, That's current measurements. Figure it's been dredged multiple times. The water would come up to approximately the level of the tablet if the statue walked through the water, not to her head. The river wasn't that much deeper back then. Now Lewis clearly couldn't find the Ghostbusters, so he's all suited up with the help of Janine, and he's ready to go. Fight. Fight ghosts, that is. Because the other thing the other thing already happened. He's, he's good to go. Now, I typically love Rick Moranis, but he did not need to be in this movie at all. His character in the first film was a bit part, and he kind of overstayed his welcome in that one as well. But making him the fifth Ghostbuster was a terrible idea. How did how did Lewis get on the team? Like when did this happen? Like he's suiting up and you know I I was I was perturbed. Did I miss dialogue? Like did I just like not see a scene or pay attention to something? Cuz why is he a ghostbuster now? Like what what led to this? This is, you know, immediately following like the parade through New York of the Statue of Liberty. And it's, there's just so many things happening at once that 
have no reason to exist. And it, it's it, it's really this makes me upset that it's just like every scene is just like adding something that was not there before or something that is just like another level of none. It's it's a shift. I guess it's like something nonsensical happens where it's like, oh, ha ha funny. Uh, my favorite Ghostbuster in this one. I mean, do we get to say Lewis because Lewis actually gets to throw on a proton pack and doesn't really do anything but really wants to? I mean, he was almost the audience surrogate at that point, that sort of geeky guy that just really wanted to be a Ghostbuster and got to be. It's also a huge missed opportunity. How much cooler would it have been if Dana or Janine showed up in a uniform to save the day at the end? I love Tully suiting up, but with earmuffs. They had a chance to be groundbreaking and totally squandered it. Him taking the bus as a Ghostbuster is pretty funny, though. Even if Slimer is the driver, he's just telling him to get there. And then, like, Lewis puts on an outfit, and it's just like, no, this isn't a funny scene. I'm genuinely confused now. You know, they just keep going back and forth with this shit. Otherwise, I think I always have to hand it to to Ray. I mean, I'm a big Ray Stans guy. All of my Ghostbusters toys that I own these days, it's all Ray Stans stuff. So, yeah, the heart of the Ghostbusters. I like Ray. I will note, it's supposed to be New Year's, but there's no snow. Or ice on the water. Oh, that's right, it's New Year's. I keep forgetting that. Oh, here, Vigo's gonna slowly take over Oscar. And the first thing he's probably gonna do is need a new diaper. We don't really see the effect of uh, happiness against the Jello cover. And why couldn't they just use the positive goo directly on the negative goo instead of, like, the lasers, if they knew the lasers wouldn't work? It's... This, it, it hurts. And then the Statue of Liberty smashes the, build, the window, smashes the skylight. So is he hitting the A button or the B button? Which, which one's jump, which one is attack? And they rappel down in, and the Ghostbusters take on Bego in one of the most lame final fight scenes I've ever seen. Now, the very end where the Ghostbusters take on Vigo is pretty good. But the fact that the day is saved by New Yorkers singing is a little weird. And then we suddenly transform <laughs> this film from a film about Ghostbusters and, uh, you know, the Vigo painting and Yanesh, the weird little creepy guy. And then suddenly everyone's outside singing songs to make everything happy to to win the day. It's also, like, not explained at all. Is, is this Elf? This is Elf, right? Yeah, this is definitely Elf. Now, I'm not normally one to complain about a movie taking its time to explain things. I genuinely appreciate uh, the potential buildup. You know, like, oh, we're just going to set this, put a pin in this, and we're going to come back to it. But, like, the whole Statue of Liberty thing happens, and that is extreme. And then they do something minor, like shoot a person with it, and then explain how it works. And it just feels like that should have been reversed. Like, you can do something small with it, see what the effect is, and then do something crazy with it, and then be given a description as to how it functions. Like, it's just... It makes me mad. Vigo steps out of the painting. He looks even less threatening in real life. Oh my god. And what kills me is that near the end of this sequence, he, like, changes his face and becomes a demon, which looks really cool. Why didn't they do that earlier? Oh, Ray offering Vigo to go knock up a hellhound. Is that a callback to Gozer and her demon dogs in the first movie? I don't know. Maybe? I mean, anyway, they, they basically break into the museum because all the good vibes weakens the shell around the museum. And, you know, they, 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 fight, they fight Vigo, which comes to life. It, it, there's a lot of more disturbing scenes. There's even one point where he, he uh, possesses Ray. Again, there, there's a lot of really weird and disturbing scenes in that. But this this is also just beat for beat, the Zool battle. He zaps them, they're on the ground, they can't move. But uh, they're saved by all the New Yorkers getting together and singing outside and being merry. And New Yorkers would never do this. Are you kidding me? It's like the scene from... It reminds me so much of the scene from Spider-Man, the scene where they start throwing stuff at Green Goblin, everyone on the bridge, and they're like, You mess with one of us! You mess with all of us! New Yorkers would never do that. <laughs> New Yorkers hate each other. No one hates New Yorkers as much as New Yorkers. And you know, in the penultimate part of the battle, basically Vigo starts getting weak, and the reason being because like outside they hear everybody out there outside singing "Old Lang Syne" because this whole movie has been kind of taking place on New Year's Eve, and it's New Year's Day. 
So everybody's having their good vibes, singing old plays line. Oh, New Yorkers singing is it's weakening Vigo because it's they're happy and showing unity. I mean, it's the theme of Elf before Elf was a thing. Why does that? So positivity just weakens Vigo in general. Weakens all the goo that the that have, that has paralyzed the Ghostbusters. Ray, we would like to shoot the monster. Could you move, please? The moment when Ray spins around and is deformed is pretty great. I mean, just taking that in context, if that had been a thing, if this movie were made today, I feel like that moment would still hit. All right, so if Vigo could just possess anybody, like possessing Ray here at the end, why didn't he do that earlier? We are forcefully reminded that Rick Moranis does still exist in this universe. But I, I forgot to mention that <laughs> that Lewis suits up and gets his own proton pack and heads out to join them and he fires at the goo outside the building at the exact moment that the Ghostbusters shoot Vigo and blow him up along with the painting and he thinks that he succeeded so that's his big character arc. He gets he he gets laid and he succeeds without succeeding. Good job, Lewis. What a step up. But yeah, that's that's the end of the fight. The, the Ghostbusters shoot a painting until it explodes. Vigo turns into a demonic head, tries to possess Ray, and then blows up because reasons. There is that cool moment where Vigo looks like a demon again. That should have been the makeup the entire fight scene. There's also a weird moment where Ray turns around and he's fully possessed by Vigo but it lasts like three seconds before they sh just shoot him with goop and he's fine again. Like, why even have that beat in there? Why is that in the movie? Well, we didn't cross the streams but we exploded the painting or the Dimension? The Ghostbusters painting doesn't make sense, but whatever. Thank God this movie is over. And how did the painting change? Like, this this is what I mean. There's there's too much happening. It's literally just like this one scene to the next thing. You know how the traditional horror thing is uh, is jump scares. You know, in modern times, we really rely on the jump scare to kind of convey terror. They're they're basically doing that with comedy in this film, and they're just like hoping that you're going to laugh at it and it it's just it makes me mad so now right before they leave the museum the painting has now been redone as the four ghostbusters in toga with oscar the baby but dana isn't there why is dana not there she was pretty pretty big part of the ghostbusters winning I mean, without her there to grab Oscar and interfere and just pretty much challenge Vigo the entire time, the Ghostbusters would have been too late. So, the hell. But hooray, the Ghostbusters are victorious and they walk outside and Vakeman kisses Dana. They're in love again. <sighs> and you can't end a film without giving them the key to the city. Lovely. Okay, here we go. Ghostbusters theme. Oh, it's back. They're heading out. Everybody's happy. All, all is forgiven. We love the Ghostbusters. And then, and then, they just left the Statue of Liberty lying there in Central Park. Okay, got it. So is everything on like a five-year like cycle that everybody forgets what's happened? Like, do the Ghostbusters remain popular for five years? How, how, does, this, how does this work? I'm telling you, if no one remembers this in Ghostbusters Afterlife, they better at least explain why. Well, anyway, that's Ghostbusters too. It, it, it really in, in the first movie, I, I talked about how it became kind of a cultural icon, you know, just, just huge. But two really put the brakes on that. Uh, I, I think. People still liked Ghostbusters after two, but it wasn't it wasn't as big of a deal. Now, the one thing that helped is the cartoon was still going on. Uh, the cartoon out, you know, I think for a few more years, even after Ghostbusters two, the cartoon was still going. Yeah, I absolutely loved Ghostbusters two as a kid. It was of just a really great movie, and again, scared the shit out of me as well. I don't know. It just it it is a great study and like a prime example of what happens when you think that a movie's plot, the characters, the interactions, 
need to gain complexity as a film nears its end. It is a fairly traditional film trope to build and build and build upon a movie so that the very end, like the the climax is a complex climax um, where so many things have to happen at once in order for the heroes to survive. And I sort of kind of feel like that happens everywhere in this movie. They keep adding characters. They keep adding shenanigans. They keep adding just anything that they can uh, relationships. It just, there's so much in this. And then by the very end, like everyone's motivations are out of whack. I'm, I'm genuinely confused. And again, just like angry. This movie is so dull. This movie is the definitive five out of 10 movie. It's a movie that is so perfectly mediocre. Like, it's not like a complete embarrassing disaster. It's not Batman and Robin. It's just so unengaging. This is a movie you leave on while you're ironing. This is background noise movie. But I really, really enjoyed it. And I've just got a lot more nostalgia for two than I have for one. I've seen it a lot more times. Um, and yeah, just, I just... I, I, I honestly, I believe it's a better movie, but I'm definitely got rose-colored nostalgia glasses on. And it's so beat for beat the original, but just done in a way that's a little bit less, a little bit lazier, a little bit less impressive, a little bit less creative. As it's playing out, it's making itself completely meaningless. Why would you watch just a worse version? of a good movie. No, it's not as good as the first one. I can say I don't hate it, though. I, I, maybe it's a nostalgia. I definitely see the the detour that they... Not even a detour. They, they took an exit ramp and just went a different direction. The original one was comedy, but still kind of horror at the time. This one had elements that were damn scary, especially for a kid, but... Overall, it was geared more for kids, and that's because the popularity of the real Ghostbusters cartoon that was now out. What were you making? This is this is not a Ghostbusters film. This is a romance film. This is uh, a buddy comedy with like three side buddies who don't need to be there. The the villain isn't. Like the, the main two things, like an antagonist and protagonist, half of those are missing from this entire film. Um, the director is honestly a greater antagonist than anyone else in this entire movie. Despite how I may be griping, I do enjoy this movie and always follow it up with the original when I watch them. It just feels like there was a much better movie that could have existed had some studio executives just stayed the hell out of the way. At least Home Alone 2 might have been the exact same movie as Home Alone 1, but at least Home Alone 2 blew up the ideas. It made everything bigger. This goes for either as big or less, which is an odd choice for a sequel. I've definitely seen this movie more than the first one, and I've definitely seen it first, which is weird. But uh, again, I think I mentioned last time, between pirating like HBO or it just it came up way later in my years I was five when this movie came out but after rewatching, I'm probably never going to watch this again another interesting bit of trivia that I think you can see in the film Bill Murray stopped acting in the same year Ghostbusters 1 was released he did like one more movie um, and then he left so this film was his return to acting and I think the character uh, Venkman's character that we get in the beginning of the film isn't Venkman I think that's genuinely Bill Murray who's just like exhausted to have to come back to do this he did want to do it albeit with kind of seemingly great apprehension so I, I think that's why his character is really great in the beginning, because he's not acting. But then as this movie just keeps going, it just turns to shit. Touching back on how a lot of people have said that Bill Murray phoned it in. Uh, first of all, Bill Murray actually never received any money 
from Ghostbusters 1. He negotiated with Columbia Pictures to finance his personal pet project. A remake of the movie Razor's Edge is about a World War I veteran who goes searching for the meaning of life after being scarred by war. And the, the movie critically and commercially bombed. It was made for a budget of $12 million and gross $6 million. So Bill Murray... Uh, never made any money off Ghostbusters. And then when Ghostbusters 2 talk came around, he did not want to do it. Eventually, director Ivan Reitman set it up. He got all the main actors back in the room. Dan Aykroyd, Sigourney Weaver, Harold Ramis, Rick Moranis, Ernie Hudson, Bill Murray. And apparently they had a lot of fun together. So Bill said, okay, you know what? I'm on board. Let's go for it. Now, again, according to Bill Murray... Between that meeting and when Murray actually showed up on set, the script had completely changed. It ended up not being the story that they wrote. He feels that he got into the sequel under false pretenses. Harold had this great idea, but by the time that they were shooting it, it was not what he agreed to. So maybe that's why it feels like Bill Murray is phoning it in. Or again, it's just Bill Murray being Bill Murray and this movie just wasn't as good. It's so hard to even have a strong opinion about this movie. It exists, but don't watch it. Just watch the original. You don't need this one. No one needed this one. I liked seeing what the characters were doing that was new at the start of the movie. That's the best part of the movie. It's few little new ideas, but the rest of it just doesn't even have to exist. Now, there was never really a sequel after 2 either. Now, I've read some things that says, like, the cartoon's supposed to take place after 2, even though the cartoon kind of started before 2. In my opinion, and we're going to talk about this in a later podcast, but the the video game that came out, it's very much Ghostbusters 3, even though it's not called that. And it's not a movie, it's obviously a video game. But the story there, well, we're going to get to that. There were originally plans to do a third Ghostbusters movie in the 90s, and for whatever reason, it just never came to fruition. Luckily, years later, we actually got that story in the form of the Ghostbusters video game from 2009. They even brought back the original cast. So stay tuned for our review of that and the real Ghostbusters coming soon. For favorite Ghostbuster, I don't know if I if I had a favor, favorite. Um, I mean, Dan Aykroyd is always entertaining. Uh, he's crazy in real life, but he's very entertaining same with Harold Harold Ramis very very entertaining guy I wish that they had utilized Ernie Hudson more and involved Winston in more things with the movie it still felt like Winston was the spare tire on uh, of this whole group I, I know in the first film he came in part way through but so much of this was Peter Egon and Ray talking and discussing things and Winston just I don't know he didn't feel like a full part of the team to me he definitely was in it more than the first film but didn't seem like a a main member I guess why does why does Zedemore exist why he he had no reason to be in the first movie and while he has more lines and appearances in the second movie he has even less reason to exist what is this movie my favorite ghost apparition specter or spirit that's hard for this one i know i mean vigo the carpathian is such a interesting character this idea of a haunted portrait is very cool having different actors play the character and voice the character respectively is also kind of fun but if i had to assuming we're not talking about vigo i think my favorite ghost might be be the the jogger the central park jogger like there's something just so casual about that ghost and by the way it was the same actor i believe that played that ghost as well as one of the scolari brothers and oh someone else i think that that actor played one other ghost in the film but i don't i can't remember off the top of my head right now but yeah i don't know i just liked it because i like the casual nature of it the idea that it felt more akin to the origins of them being basically exterminators and just this thing is more of an annoyance than anything. With any luck, I will never have to view this film again. It is it is terrible. It is so bad. So bad. I, I think, and I do not know, but I truly think that this film relies heavily on the show, which came out in uh, like 
86, uh, the cartoon to be specific. Cause there there's, I have vague memories of the cartoon and it just seems like that impacted this a little too severely. Like they, they were so intent on making this a sequel to the cartoon and not the first movie. Because honestly, I, I, I still think one of the biggest, for me, most noticeable turning points is seeing uh, Slime, I think, the green ghost seeing uh lewis interact with slime like he sees him eating all the food in the you know ghostbusters lair and that stuck out to me a lot and then it seemed like there was so much after that that was like i'm pretty sure this is a show reference so don't don't do that if you want to make a movie don't do that as far as funniest moment I mean, Janosch is just such an over-the-top character. I will say one of the things that bothered me the most about this was Janosch as the nanny, like, flying through the air as a ghost with, like, the super extendable arm to pick up Oscar. I don't know what that was about, but it really bothered me. Like, Janosch just kind of in general really bothered me in this movie. And I'm not sure why. And I think it did as a kid, too. Like, I understood that he was funny and was meant to be the weird foreign guy. But, I don't know, something about him getting supernatural and stuff was was really weird. I mean, I get it, he's Renfield, but he literally was Renfield. He played Renfield in Dracula Dead and Loving It. So, it was very much kind of the same kind of character. So, I remember seeing the name Eugene Levy in the movie Cannibal Girls when they're in the movie theater. Turns out Ivan Reitman also directed that movie. So, yeah, sh- should you watch the movie? Sure. I mean, you know, it's, it's part of the... Um... It's part of the storyline. I'm sure it's going to be relevant in some part to Afterlife. So go and watch Ghostbusters. You'll be very happy. Watch Ghostbusters 2. You'll probably be not as happy. But you know what? Hopefully you're at least entertained. And for me, it was a fun trip down memory lane. And a little bit of nostalgia kicked in there. Favorite line. Oh, boy. Um, You know, I like the you're not sleeping with it, are you? When it comes to the toaster, I like, you know, you poor man named after a hot dog and being told to put down the baby at the very beginning. Bill Murray insults a child. I think it's kind of funny. I don't know. Um, I mean, there's something about them just saying we're back and sometimes shit happens. Somebody's got to clean it up and who are you going to call? Right? I mean, that sort of was everything about this uh, thing. Also, the who are you going to call He-Man or the fact that Jason Reitman... The son of director Ivan Reitman is the child in the second movie that says, my dad says you guys are full of crap. That's the child that grew up to direct Ghostbusters Afterlife, which is a lovely little bit of behind the scenes stuff as well. So also a wonderful line. Anyway, I'm Mike from the Neatcast. Uh, thank you for having me on this episode. I love Podcasters Assemble. I, I, I love hearing all my, all my bros all my dudes and dudettes from the podcasting community talking about my favorite or least favorite movies. Guys, if you're shitting on this film, you don't know what you're shitting on, you know? Go shit in the street like a bridesmaid, yeah? That's what you should do. I like Ghostbusters 2. To me, it doesn't hold a candle to the first one. Even the score for this film. The soundtrack is fun, but the score itself doesn't hold a candle to the first one. It felt very forced, You know, it feels like a sequel, and in my mind is one of those sequels that does not surpass the original. Complete genius. I love it. Those are my thoughts on Ghostbusters 2. We'll see you guys for uh, Ghostbusters Answer the Call. Next up, I believe it's Ghostbusters 2016, the reboot, uh, or it's now known as After the Call. Is Is that one of those marketing things? That they tried to change the name because so many people shit on the movie. Oh, that's it. Is Bridesmaids next or is it Ghostbusters 3? I don't know. I'm watching Bridesmaids. I'm not watching that other trash movie. That shit. Like an all rotten hell. Stupid, stupid. Ruined the series. Terrible thing. I don't know. I I have not even completely watched 2016 because I tried to watch it and I turned it off because I, I couldn't. It was that bad. So I'm going to do that now. Well, not right now. That is next on the docket. I guess till we roll into the next stop, I'll catch you later. The Ghostcasters will return in 2016's Ghostbusters.
As for apparition, that's okay. She seems peaceful. My name is Erin Gilbert, Doctor of Particle Physics. Ah! That stuff went everywhere, by the way, in every crack. Very hard to wash off. We have dedicated our whole lives to studying the paranormal. Now there's sightings all over the city. There are people out there that need our help. Holtzman, you're a brilliant engineer. Erin, ah! no one's better at quantum physics than you. We can provide a real service. I'm joining the club. You guys are really smart about this science stuff, but I know New York. And I can borrow a car from my uncle. <laughs> uh, you didn't disclose that the vehicle was going to be a hearse. It's a Cadillac! Let's go. Let's go. Oh, oh did you want to? Sorry. sorry. I'll let you. I'll let you. Next time. Okay. Someone is creating a device that amplifies paranormal activity. And we might be the only ones who can stop it. Holtzman, come on! The hat is too much, right? Is it the wig or the hat? There's a bigger picture at hand here. These ghosts can possess the human form. The devil is a liar! Get out of my friend! Ghost! Ow, that's gonna leave a mark! The power of pain compels you! Ow! Podcasters Assemble is a production of the We Can Make This Work probably podcast network find more of our shows at probablywork.com and learn how to contribute to future episodes of podcasters assemble by looking us up on twitter and instagram at casters assemble or joining our discord page link in the show notes submissions are always open intro written by justin aki music by deft stroke sound Voice over by a guy in a basement with three daughters who's just glad he's not on food stamps. This episode was edited by Zach Derby. Thank you to everyone who was able to contribute to this episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to where you can find them all online. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the We Can Make This Work Probably Network. Follow us on Twitter at Probably Work for more of our questionable content. Also, we have a website called probablywork.com. Uh, Ray opened up an occult bookstore in Bankman Jup. And that ended up actually changing a lot about this movie. And that is the dog with the squeaky toy in the background. <laughs> Vigo von Homburg Doisendorf. Doisendorf. I feel like that moment would still hit. And that is a dog trying to get comfortable in its kennel. When there's a movie to watch and you gotta assemble, who are you gonna go? Podcasters! A bunch of white guys from the internet. Do 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 do. No, that don't open with this. Can you imagine if that was the start of the podcast? Holy shit. You know, let's play this slimes of music and watch it dance. That's what it's all about. And it's all about, you know, New York being a negative place. I don't know if it is. The slime reaching up really creeped me up out of... Anyway, then Egon, Ray, and... I forgot his fucking name again. Winston. The baby's name is Oscar. I just found that out. Thanks, IMDB. This podcast sponsored by IMDB. Showing Dan Aykroyd and Ernie Hudson being birthday clowns is kind of sad. Uh, though I think it's hilarious the kids just clown them on the... Also, there's an episode of Community with the game Sheen. Scourge of Carpathia. Sour... Sorrow of Moldovia. We also have a third side story. This time we... Gen- Did it fulfill the, the things? What's the word I'm looking for? Did it... Did it live up to expectations? Okay, so depending on where you go, you can get a the hot beverage.
Have you? Let me ask you a question too. Have you ever seen Ghostbusters Two sold by itself? Because I've only seen it sold with the original Ghostbusters. Because everyone knows no one's gonna buy Ghostbusters Two. This movie was deal. It was dead on arrival. No one's gonna spend a penny on Ghostbusters Two, except for idiots like me who are on a podcast talking about it. I'm gonna do that now. Well, not right now. I'm too drunk. But the score itself doesn't hold a candle to the first one, the Elmer... Elmer Bernstein? Am I saying that right? I have never seen a Cheech and Cheech or Chong movie with that. I, I plugged into all sorts of equipment, can never drive anything. I mean, the N- Nintendo it worked on, but, you know, no Statue of Liberty. Le- Liber- Liberty? Liberty? Oh, God. I gotta stop drinking bourbon and recording these. I, my ability to speak goes to shit. I might be getting that backwards somewhere in my head. <clears throat> Let me give you a podcast ensemble. All right, so depending on where you go, you can find a hot beverage thermal mic uh, anywhere from $20 to not available. The best thing that Ghostbusters 2 does is get Lewis laid because, oh my God, I felt so bad for him in the first movie. Just let this guy get some ass, please. Please and thank you, Ghostbusters. God, when are we doing Studio Ghibli? Come on, people. Let me give you a, a podcaster's assemble. Let me let me see if I can make it real good. Podcasters, assemble!